Zechariah chapter 2, a man with a measuring line. Then I looked up, and before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, where are you going? He answered me, to measure Jerusalem, to find out how wide and how long it is. While the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, another angel came to meet him and said to him, Run, tell that young man, Jerusalem Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, Zion, escape, you who live in door to Babylon, for this is what the Lord Almighty says. After the glorious one has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye, I will surely raise my hand against them, so that their slaves will plunder them. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. Shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Zechariah chapter 3, clean garments for the high priest. (coughs) Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him, while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave his charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, High Priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I am going to bring my servant, the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbour to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Well, uh, good morning. You'll want your Bibles open before you uh, at those uh, chapters that Bob read, Zechariah chapter 2 and 3. This is where we're going to be hanging out this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, that this is not a dead book, but is your living and active word. And though written in a different time and a different place uh, to a different people, it speaks today to us and for us. 
And so we plead, show us Jesus, build us up in him, and strengthen your people. For we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone wants to be safe and secure. Uh, So we lock our doors at night. Uh, We might have alarm systems or security cameras. We wear seatbelts in cars and helmets on bikes and so on. Uh, We're aware of the dangers and so we take necessary precautions in order to keep us and our loved ones safe. So imagine a world where all of those things are no longer available. For some weird reason, the locks don't work anymore. There's no CCTV, no seatbelts, no helmets. But all the dangers are still there. We'd probably find ourselves feeling quite exposed and at risk. We'd feel unsafe and insecure. And everyone wants to be clean. Maybe almost everyone. I mean, we've got to leave some exceptions. And so what do we do? Well, we take regular showers or baths. Uh, We shave, we keep our hair tidy, we wash our clothes and so on. So imagine a world where soap and water and hairdressers and brushes and combs and washing machines are no longer available. We probably find ourselves quite quickly feeling a bit smelly and a bit dirty, we'd feel unclean. Now hopefully, these are all very unlikely scenarios. But they might just help us get into the mindset of people, the people back in Judah and Jerusalem after the exile. Jerusalem, which had once stood as this fortress up on a hill, with uh, protective walls and ramparts and so on. Jerusalem had been utterly ransacked by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon uh, some 70 years uh, previously. And so the whole city, its walls and its houses and its temple, had been demolished and left in complete ruin. So when the people came back from exile, they had nothing to protect them from the dangers of the outside world. No walls, no gates, no ramparts, no military to speak of. And we're still here at this point some 80 or so years before Nehemiah came to rebuild the walls. And... Not just that, but the temple had gone, and its priesthood had gone, and so the people had no means of making a regular sacrifice in order to maintain their sort of ritual cleanliness before God, in order to maintain that covenant relationship with him. And so understandably, the people likely felt very exposed and unsafe from the threat of human enemies and it's likely they felt somewhat unclean before their holy gods and it's likely that all of this impacted their service of God their worship of God and left them with a feeling of powerlessness to really do anything about it. Uh, Now today, there's much that might make us feel insecure as believers and as churches. We may feel that our life of faith is so fragile, uh, and we know that we're continually doing battle with uh, the sinful flesh. 
So we can, in some respects, relate to that experience of the people back there in Judah. So we need to hear the message of the next two night visions that Zechariah uh, has received. He's, he, he had eight in all. We looked at the first two last week, and now the third and the fourth today. Uh, and the respective messages of something like this, sing because you're safe, and celebrate because you're clean. Sing because you're safe. Let's dive into this vision that Zechariah has. So chapter 2 and verse 1. Then I looked up and there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I asked, where are you going? He answered to me, to measure Jerusalem, to find out how wide and long it is. So there's this guy, presumably an angel, with an ancient tape measure. Uh, and he's taken it upon himself to go and work out the dimensions of Jerusalem. And maybe he's got it in his mind that he's doing that in order to sort of mark out the boundaries of the city with, with a view maybe of, of building up walls. So we're figuring out where, 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 does, it, where does it stop, where, where do we need to put these walls? Uh, you know, how can we build up the walls and, and fortify the city again? Which seems like a very logical and sensible thing to do, especially when you're feeling so exposed and at risk. You know, it's, it's natural that you want to take necessary steps to make the city secure against any in, invaders. But this attempt at... Uh, security measures is very quickly interrupted. Verse 3. So while the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, don't know why he's going away, another angel came to meet him and said to him, Run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord. And... I will be its glory within. So there's several things to note here. First of all, notice now that the measuring man, the guy with the tape measure, is said to be young. He's a young man. And youth is sort of characterised by impulsiveness and a lack of experience and rushing ahead. Um, I'm sure none of us can relate to that. But, but also perhaps an inability to discern the greater purposes of God, and so taking it upon himself to act. So it's not so much a, a, a note or even a warning about age, you know. It is more about rushing ahead of God and going ahead of him, or assuming to go ahead of him. Uh, second thing to note, that Jerusalem... Is, is going to be a city without walls. In other words, there will be no limit to the size of its population. There's going to be a great number of people and uh, animals. And so, what the Lord has planned is far greater than anything that could be contained within such a small area. And so you can see now why this young man is being rebuked and stopped. So says, look, your, your idea, your thoughts for Jerusalem's future is just far too small and far too limited. God has plans that, that far exceed your imaginations and your expectations. You cannot even begin to imagine what God is going to do with Jerusalem. It's not going to need walls, because there will be so many people that they will just spill straight out. But you might be sort of thinking, well, there still won't be a wall though, right? So even though there's lots of people, they'll still be exposed. Well, the Lord thinks of that. He often does. He always does. And we're told that the Lord himself will be a wall of fire around. And it's a very powerful image, isn't it? And it evokes uh, memories of the Exodus, when the, the people uh, came out of another exile. They came out of, of um, 
uh, slavery in Egypt and they were let out into the wilderness and the Lord went with them and the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of uh, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that was a pillar of protective fire. And at one stage, the Egyptians are pursuing them right up to the edge of the Red Sea and that pillar of fire swings around and stands between the Egyptian armies and the people who are at that stage extremely vulnerable and unprotected. And for a whole night that pillar of fire stands and keeps the Egyptian armies away. Uh, And so that wall, God is saying here, I will be, continue to be that protective wall of fire around you, the people. Guarding them from their enemies. And so with the Lord surrounding them, no one will be able to touch them. And then it said that the Lord will be its glory within. Uh, Like when his glory filled Solomon's temple, only this time it will be the whole city. And indeed it will spill out across the whole land, as Zechariah will say uh, later, uh, in later chapters. And so with the Lord as their wall of protection, the people can rest secure. And of course this is an image. Uh, The walls would be literally physically rebuilt at some point. Those practical, sensible steps would be taken. But this is an image that goes far beyond the immediate future of Jerusalem. uh, And points to a greater reality, as we'll see soon. The people can rest secure, and even more so because the Lord vows to deal with their enemies. So that continues the theme of that second vision. You remember the one with the horns and the craftsmen and the smashing and everything? Um, So verses uh, 6 to 9 here call on the people to leave Babylon and return to Jerusalem and Judah because there they will be safe. They might have felt safer in Babylon. And for many of them, that will be kind of all that they've ever known. But God is saying, you will be incredibly safe here. Um, Perfectly safe. Because all those who touched the apple of his eye, as he describes them, will find his hand raised against them. Which echoes the promise uh, that was made uh, to Abram. Uh, Many, many years before, God said, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so the Lord uh, uh, is acting to protect his promise, and in doing so, uh, uh, sorry, the Lord is acting to protect his people, and in doing so, uh, he is keeping uh, his promise To curse those who curse them. And then, there's this call uh, in verse 10 to shout, says the NIV, or sing, says the ESV. Now why should the people raise their voices in gladness? Verse 10, shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you declares the Lord. What a promise that is. What safety that uh, promises to them. If God is for us, if God is with us, if God is dwelling here amongst us, who can possibly be against us? And it goes on in verse 11, Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The Lord said to Abram, Many nations will be joined. I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Now, I said last week that Zechariah is quoted and alluded to many times in the New Testament, uh, particularly by John, and especially in Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 21, right at the end of the Bible, we find another angel 
with another measuring rod, this time measuring the holy city, the new Jerusalem, which was coming down out of heaven from God in John's um, vision. And that Jerusalem, that, that new city, is, will not be made of bricks, it will be made of people. It is the church, it is the bride of Christ. And in that passage, John described the, the beauty and the richness of this heavenly city, and then he explained what makes it so glorious. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 22, I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Which shows us that in our future, as the people of God, our security as the people of God, as the church of God, comes not from physical buildings, or healthy budgets, or from big numbers and successful events. Our, our safety is spiritual and will be ultimately realised on that day when the glorious new city is revealed. And it's glorious because of the glorious one who will dwell in the midst of it. But how can we know that we will be part of that new city? How can we know that sense of safety and security now? Well, the third vision in chapter 3, uh, sorry, the third vision in chapter 2 has exhorted us to sing because we're safe. The fourth vision uh, will urge us to celebrate because. Uh, we're clean. Celebrate because you're clean. Now there's a, a sorry scene in this vision. Let's read the first two verses of chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua, who's this guy? Well, he's, he's a real dude. He's not like one of these crazy people in the visions. He's an actual fella. And he's listed as one of the first men who returned from, uh, to Jerusalem following the exile. Uh, Ezra has him in, in that list. And because of his heritage and because of his standing in the community, he's recognized as a senior priest high priest. And so he plays a key role in the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and you will find his name in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, in Haggai and others as well. But in this vision, he's on trial. There's a kind of a, a heavenly cause happening. And Satan is his accuser. Satan is the kind of the prosecuting lawyer speaking against Joshua, this high priest. And immediately we find the Lord is acting here both as the judge in his rightful place, but also as the defending lawyer. And he's having none of it. He says to Satan, he rebukes him. And he says, I rescued Joshua, I snatched him from the fire, he's mine. I chose him, and I have chosen Jerusalem so keep your hands off him. Keep your hands off them. Now we're not told what Satan's accusations against Joshua are, but we are told this in verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the Lord. Now that's very striking. 
Because if you've uh, read the laws regarding the priesthood in like Leviticus and so on, you'll know that the priest, especially the high priest, was to wear the most exquisite robes covered with jewels and, and, and fine different details and, uh, and so on. But here's Joshua, the high priest in the present day. He's wearing filthy rags. And so maybe now we can begin to hear Satan's accusations. <laughs> what kind of priest are you? You're not worthy. What, what hope do these people have if this is what represents them before God? What a disgrace you are. Ugh, disgusting. And how often do we hear the same sorts of accusations levelled against us? <sighs> Call yourself a Christian. Think you can think you can serve God like that? Oh, look at all look at all the others there. They're, they're perfect. They're, they're, they're fine. But you, you're a fraud. How dare you stand before God and deign to serve him? You're a disgrace. Ever heard those voices? I hear them regularly. <laughs> and isn't this Satan's way? Feeding us lies. Accusing. That's his, his name is the accuser. The Satan, the accuser. This is what he does. And all because he wants to undermine God. He wants to rob God of his glory. And he wants to rob us of any joy and any delight in being the people of God and serving God day and night. He wants to take that away from us. And so he stands against us. He accuses us. He continues to do that. And how often do we bear the brunt of it? How often do we buy in to his lies? And they are lies. We'll see how. Joshua is wearing filthy clothes. There's no denying he looks a mess in this vision. He is not the picture of the high priest that you will find in the book of the law. But here, the filthy clothes symbolize the sin of the people, which is initially was the thing that sent them into exile. But look at verse 3. Uh, Joshua was, was dressed in, in filthy clothes as, as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And then he said to Joshua, See, I've taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. NIV has fine garments, the ESV has pure vestments, the CSB has festive robes. This is, this is like the ultimate makeover show. You've you seen those, you know, somebody comes out and they look a man, you know, and then they come out and they're like, whoa! Well, this is the ultimate thing. Joshua is stripped of all the filth, all that dirt, all that muck, those, those horrible filthy rags are taken away, and in their place he's given the finest clothes to wear. So sin is removed, and it is replaced with righteousness. And so that fear of condemnation that hangs over him, or hangs over the people that he represents, well that is taken away by the Lord himself, by the Lord's hands. And then in verses 5 to 7 there, there follows a, a clean turban and a new promise that obedience will be rewarded with a place, an established place in the courts of the Lord. But then look at verse 8. Listen, High Priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. So this priesthood 
is temporary. It always was temporary. And it points to one greater who is to come, who is called here uh, the branch. Now Jeremiah also uh, promised the same thing in Jeremiah 25 verse five, 23 verse 5. Uh, uh, but Jeremiah's righteous branch would be a king in the line of David. Joshua, of course, is a high priest. And, and next we get a stone. Look at verse 9. See the stone I've set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Now, what's this stone? We've gone from um, branches to stones, you know, jumping around. This is the crazy nature of these visions. Most likely it's a precious stone. Uh, which was used in the high priest's turban and placed there in the centre and uh, had an inscription on it which said, Holy to the Lord. So Joshua has gone from this uh, high priest dressed in filthy rags and now those have been stripped away and he's been reclothed in uh, the fine vestments and the pure vestments of the high priest and a, a clean turban has been put on his head and then the stone has been placed in that turban and it reads, Holy to the Lord. In your face, Satan. You may accuse this man says the Lord, but I've snatched him from the fire and I've cleansed his sin and I have made him righteous. And you may accuse this people and their sin which has stood against them in the past, but I have removed that sin from them. And he says, look at verse 9, the most important part of verse 9, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Now, I hope we don't have to work too hard to figure out where this points. Because, of course, the branch came. That promised branch, uh, the, the, the ultimate high priest, the perfect high priest, in the line of, a king in the line of David, who made atonement for the sins of many on a cross outside Jerusalem on a single day. So that all who believed in him who believe in him now, have their sin removed and are instead clothed with his righteousness. Martin Luther, the guy, German fellow, kick-started the Reformation over 500 years ago. He, he called this the divine exchange, where there's a swap happens. Jesus takes our sin on himself and carries it to the cross and he pays for it in full as he sacrifices himself. So that that debt that we owe God, that penalty that, uh, that, um, uh, yeah, the penalty that we owe is dealt with, it's covered. It's all uh, bound up in the sacrifice that Jesus made. So we have the sin removed, that's great. The filthy rags have been removed, but we need clothing. And so that's the great divine exchange. Jesus takes our sin from us, but then he replaces it with what? With his own righteousness. So it's not just that our guilt is removed, it's that something is added in its place. All that makes Jesus righteous, all that makes him holy, all that, that, that makes him, as it were, the, the perfect son of God is now, the, the word is imputed to us. So that we stand before God and... Uh, he sees, as he looks at you uh, and me, he sees his own son. Now go back to that heavenly courtroom. Satan here standing, accusing you. <laughs> what a waste of space. You, you know what you've done the last week. Oof, what a mess you are. How dare you? And the Lord, the judge, looks from Satan 
And he looks to us and he says, Satan, I don't know what you see. I don't know what you're looking at. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. But I've also seen my son. Bearing and paying for all that sin in full. And now when I look at this beautiful child of mine, I just, I'm, I take great delight. And yeah, their service is, oh, it's messy and it's weak and, and, uh, and you know, they, they stumble and they fall. Yeah, but look, they're beautiful. They're just like my son. So your accusations, Satan, are thrown out. They don't stand. They never will. This, this one is mine. I've snatched them from the fire. And I love them. Talk about, talk about security. Talk about being clean. You see, with Jesus, we have nothing to fear. Nothing. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne. So friends there's no accusation of Satan that can stand against us. There is no condemnation that can consume us. There is no enemy that can overtake us. There is no ultimate threat against his people that our Lord will not thwart. We are safe. We are secure. We are clean. We are righteous in our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does this mean? It means that as we serve him, out of all of this messiness that we know that we carry, let's own that, let's not try and hide it away and sweep it under the carpet. Jesus doesn't do that. Uh, in the midst of all of that messiness and, uh, and the, the fumbling and the stumbling and, and so on, let us not allow the enemy to rob us of the joy of serving him, of living for him, by believing those lies. Instead, let's, let's just run ahead. We can now. We can run ahead. And we can ignore that accuser and be confident and bold before God as we walk with him as we continue in faith with him yes bringing all of that mess and repenting and, and, and seeking his forgiveness and so on but let's let's continue to serve with joy with confidence with boldness with delight because we serve the righteous branch the risen Saviour, who makes us safe and who makes us clean. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how we thank you. We thank you because we are utterly undeserving of all that you have done for us. Were it not for you, Lord, we would stand guilty before the Father and every one of Satan's accusations would be held up in court and would stand against us and we'd have no hope and we would perish but Lord we thank you that because you died and you live and you now rule and reign and you intercede Lord we thank you that we stand and approach with boldness and confidence, no matter what accusations are thrown against us. And with you for us, uh, Lord, we know that we are safe and secure in you, and we're clean in you and righteous forever. 
And Lord, how we long for that new city to be revealed when all this dross is finally removed and all is glory and all is joy in your service forever. Come, Lord Jesus. And for now, Lord, would you please strengthen us as your people, as your servants, uh, to live for you and serve you uh, in, uh, in full and without uh, fear. And may you accept the praises and the offerings that we bring because uh, of your great sacrifice for us. Amen. Amen.